Welcome to the Patients to Art, Politics and Life Itself. My name is Nico Heller. My guest today is Iman Aoun. Iman is an award-winning Palestinian female actor, director and producer, and was a member of the world-renowned El Hakawati Theatre Company in Jerusalem before co-founding Ashtar Theatre, the first theatre school for youth in Palestine in 1991. Iman is also an internationally recognized theatre trainer, specializing in theatre of the oppressed techniques and is known for her intercultural work and use of theatre as a tool for change. Her vision for creating a better world through theatre has led her to create many critically acclaimed initiatives, including 100 Artists for Palestine in 2003, the Gaza Monologues in 2010, the One Billion Rising Palestine Campaign in 2014, and the Syrian monologues in 2015. Iman is also a board member of the Palestinian Performing Arts Network and other Palestinian arts organizations. I can see that she has arrived, so do allow me to invite her in. Hello. Hi. I can see you. Good, good to see you. Iman, thank you very much. You, I, I believe you're joining me from Portugal at the moment. Is this correct? Yes, absolutely. I am uh, on a tour with the uh, Oranges and Stones play in oh, Portugal. Ec excellent, and excellent. We, we, we will talk about this. This is obviously a very sort of current topic and, uh, and, and a very timely revival of production that you have been working with since 2017, I believe. We'll come to that a bit later, but let's sort of start with some background first. Iman, I have already briefly introduced you to our uh, audience. Um, now, you have a, a long history in use, like, utilizing the arts uh, in general, and theatre in particular, uh, to raise awareness about the intolerable situation uh, in Israel, Palestine. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's such, it's so on everybody's lips and it's such a divisive issue at the moment. So I'm really, really very, very glad that I have you as my guest today, because I think we're bringing a very unique perspective to this. Um, I mean, it's not very often that theater or the arts are discussed within the context of war and oppression. That's true. Yes, yes, absolutely. But the theater has a very important role to play in uh, such a situation. Of course, uh, Ashtar Theater is uh, always on the side of the oppressed because we are, um, first and foremost, we are Palestinians and we are living under the oppression uh, day in, day out. And, and we've been living uh, as such for the last last 75 years. So, um, so this means that um, everything that we do, we have our people in, uh, in our heart, in our mind and in our perception uh, to help them to uh, overcome and, and to uh, be able to uh, express themselves, to be able to um, uh, overcome the traumas, the, the continuous, ongoing uh, traumas that they have been living. It's like you cannot even start to talk about uh, a trauma uh, in the Palestinian context. It's like it, it's a chain of traumas that, uh, that the people are uh, facing all the time. And so uh, part of our uh, major work is to work with the youngsters and, uh, and youth in order to give them a platform to be able to express their uh, their fear, their fury, and their uh, frustration of what is going on, not only now but but in general, it's also a, a platform where uh, they. Um, cement their uh, strength. They they look for their internal. Um, uh, uh, their internal uh, abilities in order to cope and in order to be uh, stronger um, human beings to face uh, atrocities and to face uh, the vulnerability that uh, the, the Israeli occupation and the oppression uh, is uh, imposing on them. So let's, let, let's talk about this a little bit uh, in more detail, because I think for a European audience, unless, unless they are familiar with the subject, Mm. I don't think they're quite aware of how restricted life is. Uh, you know, there are well, roadblocks there. Yes. So, so the, the actual physical reality of bringing people together um, in, a, in a space uh, to work together is already a challenge in many instances. 
Um, so there, there, there are these kind of environmental, physical challenges, barriers, roadblocks, and so on and so forth. Um, and that, that make it very difficult at times. And then, of course, there are, there, there are the psychological uh, sort of blocks as well and the trauma, as you mentioned. And all of this is creating a very, a very challenging environment for somebody like you to work in. So maybe let's start from the outside in. Can you talk a little bit about the physical reality within which you operate? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for this uh, indication, because, uh, for example, I live in Jerusalem and, and to go from Jerusalem to Ramallah, which is only like uh, uh, 12 kilometers, which should take only uh, 20 minutes to reach my work, I, I have to really spend uh, like two hours or three hours uh, to pass the uh, the first checkpoint and then the second checkpoint and then uh, to reach the work and and when I come back it's the same agony uh, if you want so um, my students uh, because our theater is in Ramallah so our students who come from the villages and the the cities uh, and Ramallah itself um, many of them have never seen Jerusalem which is just as we said. Uh, a few kilometers away so um because they are uh they were born with uh the palestinian uh, um like uh, um context if you want <laughs> under uh, uh, under this um, um, separation regime um and the apartheid regime that is trying to really make Palestine into cantons and into different uh, um, bits and pieces so um also, um, not only that the, uh, the young people and the youth are not able to enter Jerusalem, uh, but uh, sometimes they, they cannot even see the, the sea, which is uh, also a few other kilometers to the, uh, to the west, uh, Jaffa and Haifa and all of that. So the whole country uh, had been uh, cut into um, a visuality of a, a Swiss uh, cheese um, block so uh, only uh, small parts here and small parts there with with enormous difficulty but but so the roadblocks that you mentioned the checkpoints the 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 separation wall uh, is internalized psychologically uh, in the um, uh, psyche of of uh, the young people so when uh, uh, the europeans when the Germans uh, think that we are uh, um, like uh, very um, uh, violent uh, towards the democratic, uh, wonderful uh, uh, country Israel, they they are trying to really not see what uh, what their action had done to us. They are um, um, putting um, a complete. Um, shed on their eyes uh, because they have created the first problem or they were part of it and uh, and the whole uh, colonial uh, approach of um of colonial uh, uh, settler regime uh, had continued from um <laughs> now it's it's more than 200 years uh, that is happening um, around the world and still is but we are the the last a country uh, to really um, face the occupation, the colonial settlement occupation, uh, and um, and that's why the fight is so fury and the fight is so strong, and and that's why uh, Europe is is really supporting the backbone of uh, of Israel, and uh, because it's their baby, uh, it's the continuation of their. Um, approach about colonialism in uh, in the uh, global south. Um, so, not to talk politics, but to talk to talk humanistic and artistic. And Absolutely, and I think it is. I think it's important to you know not to get too abstract about it as well, because um, I think you know art and theater has to be grounded in reality. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean to to understand to understand why why a company, an artistic company with excellence uh, like uh, Ashtar Theatre, would uh, would really use political theater, um, not to be um, not to be really like um, if you say 
avant-garde or or just um, uh, didactic uh, theater, but but to because the essence of uh, of the storytelling of our um, uh, root uh, cause oppression um, is not solved, and so it is our duty to really tell this our uh, story. It is really our duty to express ourselves and and to help. Uh, youngsters and and the community to um, reach out uh, w- within and, and also internationally uh, with their own story because the the mainstream media never made uh, made it right to the Palestinian cause the mainstream media uh, that is completely controlled by um, by the Zionist movement um, and by the colonial uh, powers, um, they, they do not want to listen. Do not. I want. mean, there, there, there's power in theater, isn't there? Because I think theater can, in a, in a way, kind of engage with this or sort of intertwine with this in in at, at two levels. It, it obviously at the level of narrative, and and you have done, you know, the kind of the gas monologues and the the the, the Syrian monologues, and indeed uh, the, the the production we're going to talk about later. Uh, oranges and stones again is kind of addressing the narrative aspect um but there is another aspect i think and i would like to talk about this first which has to do with the mechanics of theater um the space it creates uh, and the opportunities for expression for the experience of freedom as well um Mm. and in some ways and we come to this in uh, the theater of the oppressed if you like the the rehearsal of of rebellion as well so the theater has this kind of narrative level, but it also has a sort of um, a, another level, which is more therapeutic or pedagogical or empowering, uh, just as a kind of like, because of the play aspect and, and because of the interactive and, and the safe space it creates. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, about because obviously I believe theater of the oppressed plays a very central role in, in what you do, both in a very literal sense that you're using the techniques uh, but also really kind of if you like the philosophy inspired by Paulo Freire but then of course also by Augusta Bauer um, and and, and in, with that kind of empowerment context and I think um, you know the ch- generation of a generation growing up under occupation and oppression it is quite absolutely. easy to forget what freedom is absolutely absolutely I mean uh, to, to continue from where you stopped i would say that um a theater of the oppressed helps us to be critical and a, a critical thinking and and critical um approach to uh, life and and to politics and to meaning and to uh, uh, social engagement is an important factor. And so uh, theater of the oppressed really help us to uh, ask the right questions because it is a practice of dialogue. And because uh, that kind of dialogue uh, and turning in uh, the spectators, the receivers of the information into spect actors, into more engaged, more aware uh, audience, uh, help really uh, um, the, um, the formation and, and the uh, uh, transformation of, of the audience into uh, people who has a say. People who uh, uh, who would have um, uh, a quest, people who would really be engaged or to look for their own engagement into uh, the um, problem or into the subject raised, and so um, that is the philosophy that uh, uh, of uh, the theory of change, if you want, that Ashtar theater. Um, um, embody in in all its work and and into uh, its uh, demarch towards uh, social and political change, whether in Palestine or uh, elsewhere in the world. So, um, so the fact that we try, we really respect the the uh, the space um, of the uh, um, the audience, the space of uh, the uh, uh, colleagues or the trainees, 
to give them um, that space to think, that space to uh, um, to put their input into uh, whatever they want to to share with us. Um, that is an important uh, factor. Um, and and so if you transform the society this way, uh, if you give uh, that kind of um, uh, possibility for the people to uh, to feel their stake in in whatever they are doing, then you would uh, reach a point where you have a free society. Because part of, of the oppression is when you um uh arash how do you say when you take away uh, the freedom of the person uh, the freedom of choice the the freedom of expression the freedom of speech the freedom of uh, um reaction or even of revolution and and uh, and this is all had been imposed on us as uh, uh, as Palestinians, and and so we're trying really to uh, pave a new um, a new um, paveway, a new roadmap for our uh, youth and and our uh, society to think outside of that box to really uh, utilize different ways uh, in order to uh, express themselves. Now, theater in itself regardless if it is theater of the oppressed or um, or even classical theater, because when you look at Shakespeare, so what is Shakespeare? Shakespeare is all about political theater. He had been, uh, he had been presenting the deep human aspects, but in a political context of uh, um, uh, reigns and, uh, uh, and kings and uh, um, so, it is political because what is not political in 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 the small p and not, I mean we're we're not talking about the politics of the power game of uh, of those who govern but but we're talking about the politics of everything, um, and so it is an important aspect to look at theater as um, as a tool as a means as as one of the uh, strong. Uh, possibilities for um, the nation to uh, be able to thrive. Now, but what and I find what I find um, uh, quite quite um, um, interesting or, 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 or fascinating and important about the theater of the oppressed, and 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 you know more widely about uh, Paulo Freire's kind of you know action learning and and empowerment uh, methodology, is that you that oppression. Is something that it's a bit like colonization, you know. The, the, you know the idea that that there is the colonists in Africa and the colonizers in Europe. Yes, that is true. Um, but there is colonization going on within Europe, uh, and, and th there's an interesting discourse going on about what does it actually mean to decolonize? You know, mm. is it as much at a, at a mental and is it as a, at a level as it is as at a, at structural and, and and so forth? And with oppression, I think there is a kind of um, there, there is a sort of a program to this. First of all, um, you need to recognize what oppression actually is. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. So, 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 the idea that everybody who is oppressed automatically knows that they are oppressed and what that means is, of course, not true. I mean, mm -hmm. part of what Paulo Freire did, and then Auguste Baul obviously took it into the theater, uh, was to work with peasants, work with ordinary folk, for them to understand. You know how and why they were oppressed because unless you have an understanding of what oppression actually is and how it affects you you can't actually begin to actually address it and nor can you actually seek solidarity with other people who are also oppressed so understanding oppression getting a handle on that seems to be the very first thing that one has to achieve in order to kind of empower oneself if, if i don't have a sense of why i am oppressed or that i'm oppressed at all um then i cannot actually sort of shake off uh, those chains. And I think did of the breast gifts that uh, creates that space to explore oppression and what that means, not just in the greater scheme of things in terms of, you know, Israel and Palestine, but in a, also in a very domestic and a very, you know, very macro context, because of course, 
as you said, a lot of these structures are internalized and, you know, kind of develop a life of their own. So, so you know, th th this is why, you know, like in apartheid South Africa, you know, you know, a black communities ended up policing themselves, you know, to a large extent, um, and 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 so on and so forth. So there is there there is that aspect as well. So liberation starts with understanding one's own oppression, um, and, and so and I think you know, like the work you do is very much sort of starts at the bottom there, starts to build that up, creates that awareness, and then of course brings an audience into this so that the audience understands too, and that solidarity can build between the audience and the and, and and the actor so that everybody becomes a spec actor as you said earlier exactly um so 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 this kind of initial step i found that a really really important aspect of the theater of the oppressed and i remember like we had a kind of a short, short exchange a while ago and i said, I said how, how, how are you doing and you know the situation very difficult also on the west bank and you know are you still you know able to work and you said well it would kind of reduced almost to the psychic interventions um, and I thought that was a very interesting and a very telling comment, because, of course, when you are very restricted in what you can actually do, then you kind of pare it down to the essence, don't you? Can you talk a little bit what that is and how, in essence, you kind of practice that theater of the oppressed in communities and with your students? Absolutely. As you as you said, I mean, the internalization of uh, uh, of the oppression is one of the major aspects of uh, or major um, uh, like um, fear, if you want, that we, that we face because uh, many people living under uh, continuous uh, oppression would would not know that they are oppressing themselves or the others, and and so um, it it becomes a chain of. Uh, um, of actions where um, where it doesn't stop somehow and it kept keeps deteriorating and so what we are trying to do is to uh, somehow stop that chain to uh, to hold up a mirror if you want to uh, our uh, especially our young people in in schools in uh, in youth clubs and um, and in community centers where uh, we have seen that uh, this is the time really to get into these places and and try to um the, to make them stop and think to make them at least uh, look at the how they feel because one thing that you do usually when you are traumatized is that you shun down your feelings it's like you you start to uh, only project but you do not really um uh, like look internally um onto what is happening inside you and so um through drama and through theater of the press, we try to give uh, these um, different communities uh, a space also to be able to look internally and to discuss a, a, among themselves of what is happening to them. It's like, it's also um, one part that you start to feel ashamed of your feelings because there are so much happening around you that the that the uh, atrocities are uh, ki killing your uh, dear ones or uh, or colleagues or even your kin and and then you feel like you you're not supposed to feel that you yourself is in a bad position but but this is wrong because because you have to be able to be in contact with your inner uh, soul and uh, inner self in order to face and help the others. Because if you're not helped, if you do not, if you're not aware, as you said before, um, of the oppression that you are facing, then you cannot really help the others who are under oppression. And so uh, this is the vicious circle that we are uh, trying to break. This is um, what uh, the theater and theater uh, Ashtar and, and our colleagues are trying to really uh, do with the, the different groups. Uh, we're not only doing it in uh, uh, in the West Bank, we're doing it in Gaza as well. We have our colleagues, the writers of the Gaza monologues, who are now um, young men and women. Of course, they all uh, have um, have been. Uh, they all lost their homes, their loved ones. They're in uh, in a devastating uh, position, but. To help them, uh, 
to make them at least able to uh, continue the next day and the day after we had to to give them a meaning of the of the moment and the meaning of the moment for for them as artists is is to help others and so they've been able to really um to do interventions uh, in the society like also other uh, theater companies and other um, uh, cultural organizations were doing the same with their uh, colleagues and uh, um, and collaborators in in Gaza uh, because that's the only way um we find ourselves able to um to strengthen uh, at least the the psychological being of of our people in, in Gaza and 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 uh, talking about that we i i want to really talk about the amazing amazing uh, intervention and and the amazing work that they have been doing with the, with the youngsters uh, with the children uh, the the way they keep the smile the laughter the cheer of of the moment the way they are uh, breeding hope is something that uh, we all the world need need to uh, learn from that it's like we are watching the genocide day in day out on, uh, on the news but but the 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 internal strength of these wonderful artists in gaza um our artists, uh, those who work with Ashtar, or other artists who are working uh, in general in Palestine, um, are amazing. Uh, it, it's a lesson to be learned. I mean, you can write volumes about them. Uh, our colleague, for example, Ali Awiyasin, who's a director who had been working for um, more than 20 years with Ashtar now, he, he had been writing amazing text he had written to shakespeare he had written to um to his uh, uh, library to he had written to the people he had written to his friends in europe he had continued to write and he is continuing to write the, every day uh, talking to the world the world that that Many of them are in solidarity with us, and we wholeheartedly um, appreciate their uh, their stand with the Palestinians, and we wholeheartedly understand that uh, what they are doing is not only uh, talking or is not only feeling, but it's action, and solidarity is about action. Um, but many. Many Europeans, unfortunately, uh, they don't want to listen. They they're just closing uh, all their senses and their and their heart in the beginning, um, looking at Palestinians as a lesser uh, um, lesser god uh, <laughs> beings. So, and this is not. This is. I, I think this is particularly true of Germans, or you know, uh, and and uh, you know, a particular strata within German society, I should say, within the kind of the political elites specifically. I think there's there's pockets in Germany where there is, you know, where there is kind of um, a sense of shame about this German position, but I think it's 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 been oppressed. Um, in fact, th there's a whole part of sort of political discourse that's been criminalized in Germany. Um, and and and, um, and 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 we see this on on a, on, a, on a sort of a really very concrete basis that institutions that in the past would have kind of given Palestinians a platform um, and would have given sort of critical and these people do exist of course critical Jewish voices um, a platform these platforms these platforms no longer exist um, and that is shameful but uh, you know I, I hope it's a transitory kind of phase in. In German history, and I, I hope that Germany will learn from the mistakes, the the the, the historical mistakes it's making at the moment. Um, I have to be very careful what I'm saying myself because I don't want to sort of incriminate myself. But um, this sounds so weird. I mean, I you know honestly, um, ten years ago, if I would have 
heard myself say this, I would have thought this could never happen in liberal Europe. And now you actually have to watch what you are allowed and what you can say in Europe. And this is a really dangerous development in the face of what is actually happening um, in the Middle East, um, mm -hmm. in, in, in Gaza in particular, but also with the settlers in the West Bank. I mean, there's not much information coming through on that either. Um, and um, and it's, it's, it's terrible um, what, what's happening or, you know, you know the, the way settlers are systematically stopping aid convoys going into Gaza and all the rest and, and the collusion between settlers and the police and the military. This information, I read this in the kind of Anglo-Saxon press. It's not from what I can see. I don't see it covered in the German press. Uh, it's very, very strange. I mean, the German press in a way almost mirrors the kind of Israeli press in a weird way. And there is a total blind spot it, it, it's just not there and the people who are who do have a sort of a kind of networks and have you know a dialogue like myself and there's many of us uh we're being silenced and we have to be very very careful what we say in public now um but but do be assured i'm i'm with you hmm. um now um it's obviously I, I think there's a point and i think it's also important to say um, where the kind of the power of art is limited, you know, and there, there's a point when, you know, when genocide and when war takes over. And, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm amazed what you say, what is happening in Gaza, that there still are these attempts. And, you know, and, and of course, there's something incredibly life affirming about this experience of being creative, of creating something. And that itself is an experience of being alive. And I think when you're surrounded by death and by destruction, that is a very important thing to kind of to sense and to have with you. Um, but of course, that really isn't what theater should be about. You know, uh, this, you know, this is not it's not the responsibility of theater to kind of solve this or to in some way cushion it. I mean, it's it's very honorable and it's amazing that people are doing it, uh, but they mustn't take it upon themselves as the kind of, as their responsibility. Um, you know, there's a point when, you know, when there is really when the kind of oxygen for autistic life kind of evaporates in, in a weird way. Um, so I, I, I totally, you know, it's, I, I think it's very important also to kind of, to, to acknowledge that. Um, and, um, but of course, I think, you know, things are probably slightly, ever so slightly better in the West Bank. And I do believe that there are probably, even with all the difficulties and all the kind of increase in aggression and settler violence, I, I do believe there probably still are pockets where real theater and all of this can happen. And I'm so grateful for the likes of Ashtar um, to actually keep that flame alive. Um, yeah, well, l let me put it this way, uh, Nico. I mean, um, genocide should not happen. Wars should not happen. I mean, people should really be able to live safely and and productively and uh, uh, artistically uh, thriving in in uh, artists and non non artists, of course. Um, but uh, when when you're uh, when you find yourself in a position like this, uh, art becomes um, an important tool, an important aspect to really uh, be um, like. The alternative um, gateway, if you want, to reality. The alternative uh, gateway to hope. The alternative gateway to uh, raising awareness um, it, locally and internationally. And this is exactly what is happening. That that is the role that we found ourselves doing um, from uh, from um, October seventh. But 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 this is not the first time. Or but Hopefully it would be the last, but it, it is not. I mean, it's been going on like this uh, over years. Um, in, in 2010, when we wrote the Gaza monologues and, and we uh, um, spread it out to, to the world, it was about the um, testimony of uh, 33 young people who had lived the um, first major assault on Gaza in 2008-2009 for 22 days. And so we thought, then at that time in 2010 we thought that wow this should not be done again so we have to really raise the voice of uh, uh, of the people in gaza and especially the children because uh, children really need to live their life as as children dream uh, 
go to school, uh, um, think of, uh, of their um, future. But in 2012, in 2014, in 2016, we lost our theater in Gaza. The El Mishal was completely destroyed. 2018, 2020, 2000, every other year, every other year in Gaza, there was an assault on Gaza, on the people, on and and without without uh, any um, prior aggression. I, I think you know. I, I think it's interesting. I mean, when you think about art and and, and theater in particular, but not just theater, really the arts in general. Um, there, there's there, there's there's two sides to this, and there there is like you know, like if you like art as a public practice, uh, and as a public practice, it requires a public sphere, a public space. In which, and that has to be a kind of a safe enough space. Bombs and kind of like sniper fire and all that doesn't really help, you know, to have a public sphere because people withdraw into their own private spaces. Um, you know, so and and of course, you know, the the, the more if, kind of so if they yes. have private places, uh, if, you go, if they have, because nowadays they are living under tents. There's no private place. They're completely like in the bare uh, uh, emptiness. Yeah, but the, the interesting thing is it doesn't actually create a public space either. It kind of deprives them of all space. It's yes. it's a kind of a, it's almost as if they're being extinguished. Um, Absolutely. Now, um, obviously, you know, there, there, there have been moments when there was more public sphere and there was others when there was less. But um, of course, the arts also thrive in private spaces and in, uh, uh, and you know, and, you know, outside, you know, away from the public eye. And I think some of the work you do would never kind of, you know, reach a performing stage or may never reach an audience, but it still has a very much a role to play as an artistic practice. And as you say, as an empowerment practice in the context of theater of the oppressed. Um, but of course, if, you know, you, at the same time, it is important to, to, to also then kind of find again, uh, you know, public spaces. And, and I guess I think one strategy is, is what Ashtar is also doing, is to go on tour. Um, and of course, the fact that you've now been able to perform in Portugal is brilliant. Um, and uh, and I hope that I hope that other theaters around Europe and North America and other places will, you know, um, listen up and, you know, invite you to kind of come to their venues as well, because I think there is an ambassadorial role as well for us to have to play outside of Israel-Palestine, and there may well be a larger stage there for you at this very point in history. Um, but so 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 it's, it's quite timely that at this point, when the kind of the public sphere for Palestinians in Gaza, it's non-existent, really, as you say, but even in the West Bank, it's been squeezed to an absolute extreme. Um, that in a situation like that, that Ashta can break out and can go on tour. I think this is absolutely important, um, you know, both in terms of messaging, but also in terms of keeping the flame of the arts alive. Now, um, so let's move on to to the production you have just been uh, uh, has just put on um, uh, in, in in Portugal uh, near Lisbon in the very south. Um, and um, uh, so this is a production you first you, you you're acting in it and uh, and there's a, a, a director attached to it so you're not actually directing it but Ashtar has been producing it I believe and you you're acting in it um and it was first produced in 2017 and you've now revived it um it's called oranges and stones uh, and it's a play that basically takes us back to uh, the era of the first wave of Jewish uh, um immigration uh, to Palestine now, people always think that this happened in the 1940s, but actually it didn't. Uh, it goes much, much, you know, there's a whole thing about where does the timeline start, isn't there? There's all politics about time. But anyway, so this play takes us back not to 1948 or any other kind of day, but it takes us very much back to 1917, mm -hmm. uh, when Lord Belver, uh, basically, and when the British government uh, basically kind of came out with this Belver Declaration um, that... Um, that it basically decided that um, the, the Jewish diaspora should have a national home um, in Palestine um, and that they would encourage it as a British protectorate. So they encouraged migration to Palestine. Um, and uh, But they also specified in this declaration uh, that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Um, now, of course, we both know Palestine was not an empty land. There was people there, surprise, surprise. 
Um, a bit like, you know, North America, there was people there as well before Columbus got there. But but anyway, the, the, you know, we tend to forget. Um, but but so, yeah, it was not an empty land. It was actually populated by Palestinians. Um, and there was Jewish people as well. And they lived actually quite harmoniously, you know, side by side. Indeed, there was Christians too. It was quite multicultural um, in so many ways. Um, but there was, since the mid-19th century, there was a Zionist movement on the rise. Interestingly enough, but that's just, and I don't want to link the two, but there was also fascism actually was on, rising alongside. And both Zionism and fascism, of course, were blood and soil philosophies. We're basically saying my blood, in the case of Germans, my German Aryan blood gives me a right to have Lebensraum, to have this space. So Germans had this Lebensraum, this like, you know, living space thing, and that kind of justified the invasion of Russia and, and everything Hitler did. But of course, alongside that German kind of like, you know, kind of total delusion about their fascist enterprise, Zionism was on the rise too. And Zionism was all about Lebensraum for the Jewish people. It was kind of almost like, a, as far as I understand, as you can see, like a mirror image of fascism. Um, in a weird kind of way. And it actually evolved alongside at the same, you know, in the same timeline, the mid-19th century, they both kind of gathered yes. steam. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, 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 the British government encouraged that. Um, and, and so from the kind of early 20th century on migration, you know, to Palestine took off. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, you know, uh, you know, in fact, many of the Jews that went there initially, they were refugees. Um, and they were coming from, you know, from Europe, often sort of war-torn Europe, um, and they were looking for a new home, and they were actually welcomed, they were treated well on the whole. Um, but it didn't stop there. And, and the play kind of traces that history from a Palestinian perspective, obviously, and, you know, nobody questions that there would be a Jewish perspective who would tell the story differently, but it's your play and it's your story, and that's entirely legitimate. Um, so so you basically tell this story about, um, you know, about this... Um, impoverished uh, migrant, uh, you know, Jewish migrant, uh, who arrives in Palestine from Europe after World War I, and he said it's in the home of a local woman. Uh, and I believe in the play, you are that woman, if I understand that correctly, right? Um, yeah. And so gradually he tries to take control of your home uh, and to ultimately expel you or evict you or kind of kick you out. Um, and um, now Peter Brook, one of the kind of the all-time great sort of European directors um, called this an amazing, magnificent piece of work. So it, it kind of gives a sort of a sense of, no, this is not just some rebellious kind of backstreet kind of uh, piece of protest. No, this is actually really powerful theater that tells the story of migration and the story of colonization uh, of, of, that, of, that, of that part of the world in, quite, uh, in a quite powerful way. Um, now, um, obviously, in the current context, um, that is a, a potent story to tell because for one reason or another, we tend to start, all political discourse at the moment starts with October 7th. Yeah, it's, it's, it, that, that's when it all started. That's really, uh, and it, it, just to get this on the record, what happened on October 7th, I do not condone. I think it's absolutely terrible. Yes, it was war crimes. It should not have happened. It was absolutely unacceptable, no question. 1,200, you know, uh, uh, Jewish people, mainly women, children, so what they're terrible, terrible. And then people taken hostage, terrible. So I'm not from one moment that is saying that there's justification in that. But of course, the backlash to that with 35,000 and counting dead, um, and, you know, I don't know how many people in prison without ever being taken in front of a court or whatever, um, you know, that's the other side to that, to that, to that story. So um, within you that want do you want me to comment on that, or uh, you, you can to... in the context of the play in a second? Yes, absolutely. So, so the story really at the moment starts on October seventh with this terrible event, and then of course the backlash and the terrible, terrible things that happened since. But you have picked this play up again, and you start much earlier. So, what, what's the thinking behind that, and why do you think it's so potent and so pertinent to do this right now? Okay. Whew. All right. So. <laughs> Um, the history is long. The history did not start yesterday, did not start in October, as you said. Of course not. The history did not even start 75 years of occupation. The history had started 
way back in in 1897 when the first uh, uh, Zionist when the Zionist movement had made the Basel uh, conference and they decided then that they uh, need um, a homeland uh, for the Zionist uh, or for the Jews uh, all over the world and they started to really think of where they should go and they had so many countries on uh, on the list and then in the end they picked Palestine, because uh, there was um, a connotation with, or a connection uh, with religion. Of course, as you said, um, Jews always lived in Palestine. They're part of the uh, Palestinian context. They're part of, of the society. They're part of, uh, of the place. Uh, and they consider themselves Palestinians, um, like Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Christians and Palestinian um, uh, atheists and whoever consider themselves Palestinian. Okay. Um, the waves of, uh, uh, of immigration had started by the turn of the last century. So um, even before the Balfour Declaration. But, um, and probably the first wave came from Russia. And then um, in 1917, when the Balfour Declaration uh, was uh, released, given giving a place that, that is not theirs to people that are, that are not part of uh, the place, and not only doing that, when you said they the Balfour Declaration said the Jews and the non-Jews. What are the non-Jews? So everybody is like uh, categorized according to being a Jew or not being a Jew. I mean, um, Palestine was thriving with education, with culture, with uh, agriculture, with, um, uh, with industry, with trade. With, with translation, there were um, 14 languages, uh, alive languages that ha that Palestine was translating into Russia, into, uh, into Greek, into um, uh, English, into French, into uh, like books and, and uh, schools and, and um, missionaries and non-missionaries and, and uh, theater people and, um, and musicians and and even cinema, it was a thriving country with thriving people, with very uh, cultured people that the, um, the British mandate, uh, the, the main um, occupation that handed the land to another occupation, um, had done wrongly to Palestine and its people. So uh, what happened is um, is that uh, since 1917 onward, it was quite irreversible that uh, the the Palestinian the Palestinian um, um, resistant movement who wanted who went to the UK, who wanted to see Churchill and who wanted to, uh, to meet the, uh, um, uh, the parliament uh, at that time, were not granted even the time or the possibility to speak in, uh, in the name of, uh, of the Palestinian people. So when we see uh, UK now backing Israel, we know why. We know why. And when we see Germany backing Israel, we know why. And, and so is the US and, and all the uh, imperialistic uh, uh, Western world, because it is a project. It is the continuation of the early same project. So we know that at the moment, we have to be uh, stronger in terms of um, meaning and in terms of uh, knowledge. And when you know, you cannot say, I don't know. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with our play. 
spreading knowledge, spreading awareness. Yes, uh, the um, the man who 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 is uh, a refugee comes into the house of uh, of the woman who is the owner of the orange orchard and and the place and it's her house, and she opens up. He, she opens up her her space, her place to the man, but very soon and gradually he uh, he gives her the Balfour Declaration and he starts to really um, taking her place um, and parts of her place until he ends up taking everything and kicking her out. Now it is also a straightforward question to the international um, um, audience. You have seen and you are watching. What is your role? No, I, I, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And there is, it's, um, um, and it, it, going back to this notion of oppression and that you have to start, you know, there, there is a, um, Germany has this sort of sort of like this kind of culture of remembrance and it's very proud of it. It's it's making a big deal of it and quite rightly so because there is a recognition that we mustn't forget the horrors of the Holocaust and the Second World War and all the rest. And I totally support that. I think that is the right thing to do. And the British and the Americans and all the rest could learn a great deal from that from that culture of remembrance and kind of trying to understand the mistakes and so forth. This is partially, I think, why it's so so inexcusable, why Germany, in the case of Israel-Palestine, is so blind. I just don't really quite get it, because when you look factually at the history um, of this part of the world, it's, from what I can see, very much the story you are telling. Um, and I think, I mean, I wouldn't for one moment say that the Jews have to go away. That's not, I don't think is a solution, nor is it realistic, nor will it ever happen. But that's not also what I think anybody should ask for, in my view, should ask for. But what needs to start is a sort of a sense of that things, mistakes were made, that, you know, this was not a kind of a history of one side getting it right and the other side getting it wrong. Um, and, and this is, you know, and so, and this kind of, process of re-evaluating, of getting the story straight, of kind of basically kind of telling the narrative, I think is, I think very much what you're doing here. And I think this is really, really important. And I think it's very, very difficult, of course, both for Israel and for Jews, but also for Palestinians to move beyond the current crises without actually coming to terms with that history. Um, and uh, because for as long as there are two histories that are in, incompatible, I do remember there was a very, very interesting moment in South Africa, because if you take Winnie Mandela, which was very different from Nelson Mandela, I mean, she kind of was very heavily involved in the armed resistance and all the rest and so on and so forth. She was also a very different kind of person from, from Nelson Mandela. And she was really vilified. I mean, she was kind of, she was sort of seen as evil in many, in white circuits anyway, yeah? Um, and she clearly... Uh, appears to have been involved in some really rather gruesome killings and all the rest. So that's Winnie Mandela and Nelson is that saint. And it's very, very interesting when you talk to South Africans, there is a sort of a sense that there's a sort of a white truth and a black truth. And you know, the, 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 the white truth goes a bit like this. Yes, I understand, but, and that, that comes to but, because there, there is a sort of, you know, um, um, there's a sort of a sense that oppression uh, kind of creates a certain dynamic which has to be taken into account in evaluating. It's a bit like what you said earlier, um, you know, if the Palestinians are portrayed as these violent people, a, a, they're not, you know, for starters, they're not. I mean, that's obviously kind of a totally wrong portrayal. But yes, there have been violent instances. And yes, there have been terrorist attacks. But you know, you're quite right. Instead of saying that you have to place that in context, you have to place it within a historical uh, sort of timeline to understand. Because if you don't start to kind of try to understand, yes, please go on. No, I, I just want to uh, state, which is uh, also very important, uh, the the words that we choose uh, in this. Uh, um, I mean, uh, you've been uh, um, using certain uh, uh, sentences that I don't reckon or that I don't agree with um which when you say okay palestinians had been using um uh, like um 
violent actions or uh, you call it terrorist actions. But I do not reckon, of course, because what about the uh, terrorist uh, state uh, of occupation? Uh, you, you said hostages. How many Palestinian hostages are uh, uh, had been taken uh, into the uh, prisons of, uh, of Israelis? Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, uh, had been in prison. So are these hostages or are these only uh, prisoners or political prisoners? Some, some of them are kids of nine years old, of 12 years old. I mean, when we choose our words, we have to be careful what we say, because we should not be uh, um, uh, saying the rhetorics of, of the international uh, media or the international politics. Uh, for me, um, there is misinterpretation um, uh, of, uh, of the Palestinians and their struggle. Be, uh, we've been under occupation for such a long time. Uh, nobody wanted to even uh, listen to to us and uh, and give us our rights. Uh, uh, even when um, the 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 Oslo Agreement, which is very bad uh, and and which was completely deteriorated by the by the Israelis, uh, like a few years uh, afterwards, when um, uh, when they killed. Um, uh, um, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I I couldn't even remember the name. I'm so I'm so sorry. But the 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 prime minister. Um, uh, so um, th th what happened is that we always stigmatize the Palestinians. We always because because Palestine is not a strong country because Palestine is not being uh, recognized uh, by. Uh, by the Western uh, world, that's this is historical um, crime that I do not, I do not want to be part of uh, of this consent. I don't want to be in in an interview that that would stigmatize my my people and, and my country as such. Oh no no I, I, I'm, no no sorry so so if if uh, th uh, this was not my intention at all, uh, I was basically sort of. At that point, presenting, if you like, the other side of that of that story, uh, and it clearly is the case that you know certainly you know you know most of Israel and you know many people in in Europe and the U.S. would consider uh, uh, these acts uh, as, as as terrorist acts. Now you see that different. I can totally understand that, but I think this is exactly the problem when you have a Palestinian truth. And when you have a Jewish truth, this is a bit like a black truth and a white truth in South Africa. And the question is, how do you actually kind of, in a way, kind of solve this? How do you somehow break through this? And I think theater has a really a very central role in this to play because theater doesn't ask you to kind of argue it out with your opposite number. Theatre asks you to tell your story in a kind of in an authentic and a truthful way. And of course, it also asks the audience to give you to give you the opportunity to tell that story and to engage with it in a kind of honest and 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 so forth way. And I think that is that's the power. And I think in a way, somehow, uh, you know, this is you know, um, uh, I think these two truths um, will coexist for some time. And people like yourself are great ambassadors of one of the, you know of the one side of that of that story. Um, and it's going to be in part down to your skill um, and 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 you know your your talent and 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 so forth and also your resources as a theater producer um, to kind of get that story out. But as a German, as a German, and and the question is is for you and and beyond you, uh, would you accept the Nazi uh, story or point of view against a Jewish point of view at the time of uh, Nazism? Well, the thing is, I mean, this Absolutely. is something. Yeah. Like, like, I, I, I just, I don't want you to answer it. But would you, would you accept a Nazi um, point of view against a Jewish point of view at the time of Nazism? That, that is an important uh, aspect because uh, it's, it's about right and wrong. It's about uh, oppression and, and, um, uh, and a complete deterioration of. Uh, another people or um, 
because you feel that you are stronger and because you feel that you have the right uh, to have um, a nation or to have um, the power or to have the um, whatever um, whatever status or situation. Well, I mean, I mean, this is a really important point because, of course, part of my life story is that I left Germany as a young man and I spent most of my life outside of Germany in the UK. So I, I don't really so fully identify with being German. I spent 30 years um, away. Um, and um, but have asked, and have, of course, you know, the moment you are abroad as a German, you're confronted with this head on straight away. Um, I remember like when I first was in Belfast, you know, I was in a very deprived part of Belfast and the local kids would always warn me when there was kind of like some trouble happening because this was before the Good Friday game. And they would, the moment you, that, would, and they said, that was called, that was German, they would call me Hitler. They would say Hitler, Hitler. That, you know, that's what they called me because I was German and I thought that was really funny. In the beginning, I was really terribly ashamed of that, but I thought after a while, I thought it was funny too. Um, so, so, you know, like the thing is, is, and it, it, this is, you know, at that point I began to wonder, well, for as long as Germans have this kind of like sense that yes, Hitler was absolutely bad. There's no question about that. Everything, the whole fascist movement stood for is absolutely, you know, can only be rejected as wrong. But the problem is if we don't allow ourselves to try to understand, look, why would it be that so many people fell for it? Surely it had, had to be attractive in some ways. You know, you know, the uniforms clearly were sexy. When you look at them today in second hand shops, they look dusty and funny. But at the time they were really cool. And it goes on and on and on. The the kind of the photography of Eleni Riefenstahl was really attractive. The, the geometry, the kind of the kind of Romanesque kind of architecture, you know. Um it, it, Clearly, there was something very, very hypnotic, something very engaging, something very aspirational about fascism for so many. Remember, Germans didn't capitulate. It wasn't like, it was, you know, Hitler was not like Mussolini. Mussolini was hung up and killed at the end of the war. No, Hitler wasn't. There, there was like 13-year-old boys defending the bunker of Hitler in Berlin at the end. You know, there was never, um, Germany never, never, never gave up, you know, uh, and, and so they never really left that behind. Only later were they kind of re-educated. But, but there is a real, unless we begin to try to understand what was so attractive about it, we can't prevent it from happening again. Because we don't really understand what actually what the dynamics of it are. And we see the rise of the far right in Europe and in Germany now again. And when we look at the way people, when I look at the way people talk about this, I kind of feel it's so besides the point. You know, those kind of very sort of centrist or whatever kind of bourgeois people talking about those terrible right wingers and, you know, whatever. They don't understand what drives and motivates them, you know, where they come from. So I think, yes, absolutely. I think it's important to try to understand Hitler and where people came from and not to kind of this put them, you know, out of And the same thing, of course, I would say goes for any conflict. Um, it's like, unless you understand why Palestinians feel the way they do, how can you ever honestly engage with Palestinians? Unless you understand how Jews, Jews feel, and it goes on and on. But of course, it's a very, very, very hard task to ask you to do, because the, the pain that you've been put under is so enormous um, and historical and so but, long running. But, but we are the Jews of Germany at the time of the Nazis. It's not that we are the Nazis vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the Israel at the time. And this is what is different. We feel that we are the Jews of, of what is happening, or we are, this, the assimilation is like what, that we are at the, at the moment, um, like the Jews that were in Germany at the time of, of the Auschwitz and, uh, and the Nazi Germany. And well, I think I, I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't accept the direct sort of like comparison. I think you know and, and for very obvious reasons. That's for you, but this is how we feel. I accept that, but what I what I what I what I do kind of like agree with you is is that there is a sort of a level of dehumanization, um, you know, a level of you know sort of you know where a desensitization, where you know you know where Palestinians can be treated in a way 
I mean, I wouldn't even say like animals because people don't really treat animals that badly, you know? Um, but they can be treated in such a bad way without actually raising too much. I mean, what's happening in Gaza at the moment should lead to absolute massive outrage across Europe and the US. It's hypocritical the position countries like Germany take. How can they? They just have to see what's happening. But we're so dehumanized, so dehumanized that the life of Palestinian, you know, let me put it the other way around. It seems to be a case where the life of one Jewish person is worth the life of 300 Palestinians. I think that's about the ratio at the moment uh, of 350, in fact. Um, so, you know, so, so so this is this is just terrible. And the, that level of dehumanization is absolutely something that the current situation has in common with what happened in Europe in the 1930s. But there's other aspects where I don't think the, the comparison really holds so well. But but, but let, let me say this, is it, we don't need those historical comparisons. We can literally just look at what's happening right now in Israel-Palestine. And you, what I find really the importance from my very humble and, you know, not really so super educated point of view here, but what I find really important, you mentioned this earlier, is, is that we look at really at the last big colonial project. I mean, South Africa was the, the other one. Um, and, and now, you know, and now, and it's not at all surprising that South Africa would take Israel to the International uh, Criminal Court, uh, International Court of Justice. Um, so it's not entirely surprising because there's obviously sort of a sense of, I don't know, solidarity or sort of a sense of understanding uh, that many other nations, especially in Europe, seem to lack. Um, but 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 that, that's so so absolutely. I think solidarity with Palestine is absolutely important, and so is of course also solidarity with Jews. That's not the same as sort of saying Israel, because this is a conflation that I kind of find very difficult. I mean, one can be absolutely solidar you know, show solidarity with Jewish people worldwide, and still you know kind of condemn what Israel is doing at the moment in Gaza. I think the two things are not a contradiction. Um, I mean, I mean, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and and uh, Jews for Justice, and uh, I mean, uh, as we said, we do not have a conflict with Judaism or or the Jews. I mean, the the, the problem on the ground is a political problem. It's a colonial uh, problem. It's an imperialistic problem. It's a, it's the problem of uh, of uh, putting one nation in in the place of another nation on uh, on a land that belonged to. Uh, uh, to the Palestinians, so that that is the problem, and and so when we are against uh, the uh, um, the Israeli occupation, uh, we are against that that project. We're not against the the individual people or we or the Jews as Jews, because uh, there are many Jews who are part of uh, of our uh, resist of the resistance movement in general around the world, and uh, look at them uh, in the U.S. for example. Um, so yes, going back, going back to theater, going back to the fact that theater is an important aspect, that theater is is part of uh, keeping the human the the human aspect of our um, being of our essence um, uh, on this uh, earth alive. Because um, as as Boal uh, once said it, I mean, um, we started to become humans when we started to realize who we are, when we started to um, to look at at our actions and and uh, being aware of them and and realize them and and realize uh, who we are as as an entity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what is surrounding us so that what makes us human it's not it's not how what what party do i belong to it's not what uh, how much uh, power or money i have it's more uh, how much i am aware that that we all belong to one um part of uh, of this cosmos which is the earth and now we're trying as human beings to uh, to invade other planets where we now the project is not uh, invading other lands on on this uh, earth but it's invading other planets uh, uh, outside of it and and the project is is becoming uh, more and more 
vicious and and more and more um, like uh, abstract and uh, and difficult because uh, where to stop and where to begin really like um, there's always uh, the 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 macro aspect but there's a, the, there will continue to be the micro the the individual the uh, the small community uh, the group of people the the uh, uh, one society or one nation etc cetera, etc cetera. so as artists we have to really look at at the micro all the time and and look for the happiness or look for the beauty the aesthetics or look for the critical eye also on what is right and what is wrong as we um when we started to talk about it in this uh, in um interview but um so yeah i think um i think we have to keep on the card of uh, not losing our humanity because uh, in every um corner we can find a possibility in every um even in every bad thing we can have a speck of uh, of light um and vice versa um per personally i do believe in taoism and i think that uh, there's nothing that is totally uh, right and totally wrong there's always a, a possibility of uh, a, a finding uh, cohesion and finding um, the the utmost possibility of making change, change that would allow us to to be more uh, more humane and uh, and more just, if you want. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it is the time now to um, to think of uh, of justice, and maybe it is the time for Europeans to really um, accept the fact that Palestine is a nation, it should be a country, a sovereign country, uh, that Palestine deserve uh, or deserves to be uh, fully and completely recognized. I, because... I mean, uh, Iman, to be, to be, to be, uh, to be honest, I, I think this has been such a cathartic, such a terrible, terrible, explosion of inhumanity of brutality um that i, I think a, a clear consequence will be and we see the sort of the tectonic plates shifting we see a, really a change in the us the, the way um a lot of young people in the us look at israel palestine the biden administration has got great difficulty kind of keeping that together um like on the campuses but also in the streets there is there there's a strong you know the kind of the black life matters kind of like campaign seems to have spilled over into a sort of a free palestine kind of movement uh, mm -hmm. so this is this is happening in the us um, i also feel strongly that the kind of oppression and the sort of the the kind of censorship that is currently keeping germany you know in place is not sustainable and and there are increasing critically voices coming out as well and i think some of the stuff that i've said earlier during this interview i'll probably come to regret um uh, but there you go um <laughs> but uh but so so i think we are seeing finally i think we are seeing a, the beginning of a new era for, 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 for israel palestine um and and i think you know as brutal and as unforgiving and as terrible it is uh and as as tragic as it is um, there is also, in my view, a glimmer of hope that out of this kind of total catastrophe, this total nothingness, that something new can be born. We've seen this after the Second World War. Um, you know, there's been a lot of goodwill on all sides to establish the UN and, you know, the human rights charters, this, that and the other. And I think we may well have another one of those historical moments where some real change will have to happen and where kind of key players will make that happen. Now, I think Ashtar... Let me just to, to get to this point. I think Ashton has a critical role to play in that transition. Um, and so I would like to end on this kind of question of let's just kind of look beyond the current carnage um, and the ca current situation. And where do you see Ashtar's role in moving forward into a new Palestine, into new Israel, Palestine, whatever the future might hold? First of all, let me let me uh, correct one um, terminology. Uh, 
it's called Palestine. And if you want, it's Palestine with a question of Israel. <laughs> but it's not called Israel-Palestine, at least when you talk to me, please. Okay, so uh, for for me, Palestine is um, when when everything would happen and like as Phoenix, uh, we, hopefully that we would rise again. Um, there will be um, a continuation of work um, that never stop. We will um, do um, one one thing that is at the moment uh, important is that we're trying to create a new way of uh, sustainability, um, not only for Ashtar, but uh, but for many more uh, organizations, which is to be backed away from the uh, colonial money uh, of keeping the, the status quo of uh, um, coma, a political coma in Palestine. But uh, we're trying to really create uh, a new way of uh, uh, subsidizing funding uh, the arts, uh, more uh, connected uh, with the uh, with the community or with the um, so the solidarity movements and and uh, with uh, people who are able to support us uh, internationally and and locally. Now uh, we are a school of theater, um, or. Uh, and and we will continue to uh, to teach theater for our youngsters and and youth. Um, we are um, a professional theater company, and we will continue to do uh, professional plays. At the moment, we are doing a new play uh, under the uh, the name uh, Guernica Gaza. So um, the the two uh, prominent uh, uh, writers have written Naomi Wallace and uh, uh, Ismail Khalidi so um, and Emil Saba the director and the artistic director of Ashtar Theatre will be directing this with uh, a group of um, uh, of uh, young professionals so um, so this play is uh, will be starting to tour at the moment we have also uh, Oranges and Stones that has uh, a tournée in uh, in Europe, uh, in France, in the UK, in uh, in Italy, in South Africa, uh, and hopefully that it will uh, continue to tour. Uh, we also have another uh, production uh, talking about the, the cultural differences between uh, uh, living in in Jerusalem and living in France for one of the artists. Uh, so there are many. Uh, many plays, um, hopefully that we will be um, continuing because we believe that what we are doing is important uh, for our community. And uh, as soon as we are able to uh, to rebuild in, uh, in Gaza, that is another aim for Ashtar is to help our uh, theater community and, uh, and theater um, group, our colleagues, to uh, find their space again in, in Gaza and, um, and maintain the work. So because we believe that theater could be one of the most important um, interventions uh, to, to heal uh, young people and, and um, and adults as well, of course, because uh, because as we said before, uh, theater speaks to the heart, speaks to the mind, and speaks to the body, because it, trauma is it would find places uh, in your physical body and in your mind, and uh, and and will deteriorate your your spirit. So theater would be uh, the one of the strongest ways to um revital uh your uh, our spirit and and uh, um, to um to grant um a, to grant a possibility of uh, of checking oneself and and uh, and proceeding further in uh, in life because um, as psychologists were putting it the, the other day uh, that Gaza would need 70 years 70 years only to recover psychologically 
Yeah, I mean the the entire infrastructure in in in, in Gaza is also destroyed, and the universities and the schools and the hospitals and everything. So yeah, just rebuilding that will take a long time, and then of course a whole generation of youngsters will be without education in the meantime or with limited education. It's it's a terrible terrible tragedy. Um, Iman, I'm really really grateful that you've been able to take time to talk to me. Um, there's always a kind of a, a sort of a certain gulf between like a European uh, and, and and a Palestinian, especially some a Palestinian who lives in in in, in Ramallah in, in in Palestine, um, and uh, and has has quite a different perspective from uh, from from a European, certainly from me. But I, I do hope that there is enough, if you like, of a common ground here uh, to develop that dialogue and um, uh, to um, to to stay in touch. I. I absolutely support what you're doing. I think the work you're doing is incredible. Um, and um, and I believe that you probably also take donations. I'm not sure whether you have a facility to take donations on your website, uh, on the Ashtar Theatre website. I can, I can share with you the QR code of our psychosocial intervention in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. And so you people could really donate on that if they like. There's also um, the the bio uh, where people could really get into it and and check all our work and uh, and try to to see where they like to uh, to connect with us and uh, we're we're all the time looking for friends uh, and uh, partners and we're open uh, we don't really limit ourselves to uh, uh, to anyone <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Iman, thank you very, very much. Now, what's your immediate plans? So you, you kind of finished now in Portugal, I believe, or do you have further shows coming up? Yes, yes, absolutely. Tomorrow we're we're performing in uh, Coavela. Oh, nice. Uh, in northern uh, uh, Portugal, and then uh, next week in Lille, and uh, and then in, um, in uh, Paris. Um, and we will go back home and, and then uh, again to the UK for a tour in uh, Liverpool, in Oxford, in London, uh, in Newcastle. So hopefully. Excellent. I'm, I'm really, really glad to see that you're out and about and that you're kind of keeping up and, uh, you know, the good spirit and yeah. And, and keep telling, you know, the story of Palestine, which I think is a really important story to be told uh, in, 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 you know, in, in, you know, in, in this dark and in, in this dark situation right now. Uh, Iman, um, I'm really grateful that you're here um you know um and um i wish you all the best and um and thank you very much for taking all this time to talk to me um and, and i yes i will speak to you again very soon thank you so much i mean i'm i'm really glad that uh, um i was also uh invited to be part of uh, of this wonderful uh, talk so uh and uh, of course um i'm i'm glad if, if the people would be listening to us and uh, and there will be the as i said the qr code of uh, checking ashtar theater um and they are most welcome to follow us excellent absolutely if you send that to me i'll stick that under the video um and then people can easily access it that way uh you know and obviously the link as well because the, the link works better with the the podcast absolutely okay excellent Thank you very, very much, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.